welcome to Infinity. I'm Charlie Serafin. We've got two special guests who will be presenting information about an extraordinary research project that very few people know anything about. Stan Tennant is an engineer and inventor. He's designed and produced optical, electronic, and medical equipment and holds several patents. He's currently researching a startling discovery he made 10 years ago of what appears to be a pattern or code in the letters of the Hebrew text of Genesis. He calls this project the Meru Project. And we'll go into the meaning of that word in a minute. John Keeler is a businessman and world traveler. He's a mountaineer and has led expeditions to different parts of the world. He's always been fascinated by science and ancient religious texts and has been working with Stan Tenen on the Meru Project for the past year. I read some of the material that you sent to us, so I have a vague idea of what this is all about. But before you describe the Meru Project, I just wanted to say that I've heard a lot of different approaches and interpretations of the Bible but yours is the most unusual. Can you describe what the project is all about and what is your basic premise? Okay. Um, basically, there is a good deal of, call it evidence, in the historical record. Um, there are mystical teachings. There are, in the religious um, communities, schools that have teachings. In, in the Hebrew um, community, there's Kabbalah and Kabbalism and uh, various offshoots from that. There's also Christian work in the Kabbalah, which is a number system that alleges that there is coding w in each letter in the sacred texts. Now, what I've found really isn't Kabbalah, but the legends that are in the Kabbalah and in the rabbinical teachings and the Talmudic teachings and in some of the early Christian teachings and related schools, um, the legends seem to describe what we found here better than they are validated by the standard Kabbalah that's given. Um, and by Kabbalah, um, in its simplest form, basically both the Hebrew and the Greek alphabets were used for counting purposes around um, 300 B.C., around the time of Christ. And each letter was given a numerical value. And those letters were then used on coins to indicate the denomination of the coin and such. And so there's a standard numerical value associated with each Hebrew and Greek letter. But my system doesn't use those values, and so we don't have a direct connection with the material as it has survived the Dark Ages. Have you ascribed new values to the letters? Well, I don't know if they're new, but they're new in our time, in that um, the counting system that I'm using is based on a logical approach to looking at what we now have as the Old Testament. Um, it isn't based on the historical approach. Historically, they counted the, well, the Hebrew and, and the Greek and the English alphabets are parallel to each other, and so the first letter in Greek it would be um, alpha. In Hebrew, it's aleph, and in English, it's a. Um, they get, I'll use the English names because I think that'll be easier. Okay. okay? Yeah. So I'll, if I use an English name, I'm really talking about a Hebrew letter that corresponds. Um, the a in the standard Kabbalah is given the value of one, and they count by ones for the first nine um, numbers. So they count a is one, and b is two, and c is three. When they get up to um, what would be j or i in English, um, then they count by tens, and so um, J would be 10, and K would be 20, and L would be 30, mm -hmm. etc. And then when they get up to Q, they start counting by hundreds, and so Q is 100, and R is 200, and etc. And since they're 27, they count 1 to 9, mm -hmm. um, 10 to 90, mm -hmm. and 100 to 900. Mm -hmm. And that uses up 27 letters. 9 times 3 is 27. Um, that's interesting, and I would not at all want to say that what the traditional Kabbalists are doing is in any sense wrong. It's simply a different perspective than what I seem to have stumbled onto here. Okay, what's a logical approach to uh, ascribing okay. values to the letters? Well, that has to go back to why did I start to look at this in the first place? Which is a good question. Why did you start to look at this in all the right. first place? I don't know. <laughs> I, I picked up a copy of the Old Testament in Hebrew. Uh, I don't read Hebrew. And I don't, I'm ignorant of religious affairs. I'd never read the Old Testament or the New Testament. I'm just not a religious person, didn't have that background. But I did manage to learn the Hebrew alphabet. And my background is in science and math. Um, basically, I'm a visualizer. I'm a pattern recognizer on the IQ test. That's the part I did well. I didn't get the English so good. Okay. But I got the, uh, the geometry, the pictorial stuff. That's my forte. And... Because my eyes fell on the letters rather than the words of the text. I mean, if I could read Hebrew, I never would have looked at the letters. You don't pick up the Sunday paper and start counting letters in the headlines. It's silly. 
but I couldn't read the words. And I'd already known vaguely that the oldest documents didn't have the um, words broken up, the letters broken up into words. They were strings of characters without word divisions. In any event, my eyes fell on the letters, and my intuitive sense said to me, there's something wrong with that pattern of letters. I've seen it someplace before. It's odd. They're the wrong number of letters. There's something. Well, I thought I would just go and ask a rabbi or a priest or someone what it was, and they would tell me, and I'd be a nice little riddle I found. Wonderful. Um, the more I asked, the more I found nobody had ever heard of any of this. And people said, well, that's Kabbalah. And so I read up on Kabbalah and found it wasn't Kabbalah. Um, okay. I was left with trying to figure out where do you start from. And I had 10 years between when this first came up and when I essentially cracked it or cracked into it um, to think about what would the qualifications for, for a message be and how could I recognize one. And I drew up a set of criteria. And I felt if the first question was, if the text is coded at the letter level, um, that's pretty serious. That makes an enormous difference, and I can't handle it um, casually. I have to, if I'm going to be a responsible researcher and not base my um, system on tradition or on religious belief or what, whatever, but try mm -hmm. to bring it into the 20th century, then I have to use scientific methods, which means you don't guess. You lay out a theory first, and then you check the theory. You check your conjectures against what the data is. I'm sure one of the questions that you dealt with, but I'd like to put it in at this point is the original language of the text are you sure that the, what you're working with in the Hebrew is the original language because if it had already been translated Very good through question. then the, the one of my first questions was um, well I thought being ignorant about religious matters that the Old Testament was one of the most researched books in history turns out that's not the case there are no Dead Sea Scroll copies of the Genesis material I'm only talking about Genesis here I haven't looked at the other books although there are legends about the other books and about the New Testament as well. I just didn't feel confident. Um, there are several opinions as to what happened and when. There is a mystical tradition that Moses wrote the Old Testament in hieroglyphics, in Egyptian hieroglyphics, that they were changed to Canaanite Phoenician characters, 22-letter standard Middle Eastern alphabet at the time, in Solomon's time, and that it was translated again and recodified by Ezra the scribe um, about 400 B.C., and finally translated into Greek, um, the so-called Septuagint translation, at about 285 B.C. We don't have any of copies of any of that material. What we have are copies of copies of copies that date back to the, um, well, maybe 1000 A.D., um, that were written up mostly by the Masoretes, which were um, from the rabbinical tradition in normative Judaism. And they put the vowels in. There was no known way to pronounce the material. The, the rabbis believed that it was pronounceable, but it didn't survive. Um, the rabbinical legend, of course, is that this is the way the text always was, and that all Ezra did was sort things back out again. In fact, no one knows. In fact, the best that I can tell now is that the Septuagint translation made in 285 B.C. was made under duress by a combination of Essenes who were the renegades from normative Judaism and um, pre-Christianity, and the Pythagorean initiates that were the outcasts from um, Greek society, pagan Greece, and that between the Pythagorean initiates, mathematicians and scientists of their age, mm -hmm. and the Essenes who maintained the old traditions, um, they were able to reconstitute the text, and in fact they changed the alphabet from 22-letter Phoenician alphabet to this new 27-letter alphabet, which is called the Maruba alphabet. In any event, I decided to put aside all of that. Okay. All right. You, that's all you've got? You can't really trace it back? No, to it didn't go anywhere. Yeah, go and anywhere we could talk it, for so. days on the origins of the Old Testament, okay. and, and um, I don't know if we have time to So you to took count. what you looked at, which attracted your attention in the right. first place. And, well, and what I decided is that we had a situation similar to the Arecibo message. Now, the Arecibo message is a radio m signal that was sent out of the Arecibo radio telescope in Puerto Rico by the Jet Propulsion Lab under the auspices of, of NASA that had them draw it up. And basically, it's a code that we sent into outer space that um, hopefully was designed so that an extraterrestrial could understand it. An extraterrestrial couldn't understand an Earth language. If Genesis dated from so far in the past that the language was truly lost, then we were dealing with a similar situation regardless of its source. And so I looked at the Arecibo message that our scientists had drawn up as a prototype for what to look for. 
Well, in order to translate the Arecibo message, you have to guess it's in base 2, binary computer math, and you have to guess that the total number of pulses they sent out has only two prime factors. And you make a TV picture of one prime factor long by the other prime factor wide, and you check off the boxes on the TV screen, like a little XY coordinate system, and color them in black if they're ones and white if they're zeros, because it's a binary code. Mm -hmm. And you get a little high contrast TV picture, which shows, if you look at it right, a picture of a little man and a semblance of, of the double helix, and lists some of the elements of, that go into the double helix, the elements of life, and a picture of the telescope and a picture of the solar system. Um, and the idea is an extraterrestrial, if they get the message, and if they guess it's in base two, and if they guess the two prime factors, is going to have a picture that is obviously of intelligent origin, and they will recognize it. Well, I decided to look at the Genesis text from that point of view. That was consistent with the legends. There's a rabbinical legend that the 22-letter alphabet was changed to the 27-letter alphabet so a future student could redeem the alphabet. And I said, what does redeem, de redeem mean in the physics sense, in a technical sense? And I took it to mean decipher. All right. Um, I can tell you how I cracked it, but it gets a little technical. I think it's better to say that I found a counting scheme that assigns to each letter a numerical value, also assigns to each letter a mathematical operation that corresponds to its geometrical shape. And so now you, that's a little, no, that's difficult. A little, that's little, a little difficult to comprehend, so help well, us out with it. Well, you know, um, some of you may have had math recently enough to remember in high school, they teach you that um, if you learn about complex numbers, that the complex number plane, if you multiply anything by the square root of minus 1, it's the equivalent of rotating the graph by 90 degrees. So in modern mathematics, you can believe me on this, I wouldn't make okay, it Okay, a lot of people might not remember Multiplying <laughs> something by the square root of minus 1, okay. a number, mm -hmm. which has no simple solution, it's called the imaginary number i, is the same thing as geometrically picking up that thing and turning it 90 degrees. Okay. okay. That's a, a geometrical operation, and the, uh, and the square root of minus 1 is a numerical, is an algebraic operation. Well, that's what we've, we've hit on here. And so you're, are you talking about a mathematical operation that in v visually corresponds to the geometric proportions of the shape of the letter? I'm talking about that potentially being one means of, of deciphering this material, if okay. my conjecture turns out to be true. Now, there is another coding system that we're familiar with that works very similar to the one I think is being used in the Old Testament. And it's our own DNA. That, in fact, DNA uses four letters to form a, a code um, in double, doublets of base pairs, and they end up being 64 codons, 64 possible words in the genetic code, and you string them along side by side, and you can read off genetic code off of a, off a chromosome that way, just by reading the letters of the code that are chemical bases, and each one has a separate shape as, as well, off of that string. Um, if an extraterrestrial, and I'm not saying that's where the message came from, but and we can talk about that too, um, if an extraterrestrial was sending a message to an earthling that they knew something about, what better place to expect an earthling to look for a message in than in their own form of coding? we're coded for in that form. That's an ideal way to send us a message. Hopefully we've thought about ourselves. One definition of consciousness is that there's self-consciousness, there's self-reference. And so examining ourselves is one sign of higher consciousness. That's who you'd want to send the message to, some form of life that was looking at itself. Okay, but it's taken such... Th I understand what you're saying, but it's so difficult for me to comprehend never having seen a DNA molecule right. and never having read or deciphered the code, All right, well, let's, not let's only of my that. own, but of anyone else's, that, that intelligent life was expected to be introspective to that degree. Well, I've had 10 years to think about what some okay. of these c conditions and criteria for a message would be. Um, I decided, first of all, that if I was going to find the message, I had to assume and remember it was an assumption that there was a message. In other words, I had to give the benefit of the doubt that there was a message. I had to assume that it was a logical message, that if, certainly if I'm looking at individual letters and not at the words, um, in fact, the words were defined by that translation because there was none other. 
Um, so if I'm looking at the letters, then I have to find some sort of a mathematical meaning to each letter. Each letter is like a hieroglyphic, it, not in the, the Egyptian pictorial hieroglyphic sense, but in the sense of uh, an, in, an integral, integral sign is a hieroglyphic to a mathematician, um, or a dollar sign is a hieroglyphic to a motorist. You know what that sign means. It means you're going to pay. That's what those are counting, is dollars. Well, I had to interpret the text that, that in that way. It couldn't be language. It had to be symbolic, and the symbols had to be natural symbols. Not only that, but my hypothesis was that anybody sending this message was doing the opposite of what most messages that are coded are sent for. Most of the time, you code something to keep it hidden. But in fact, what the JPL scientists did, and what anybody attempting to send a message would be doing, would be to try to make it as obvious as possible. And so they would include the key of the message throughout the material, and particularly at the beginning, and make it as obvious as possible. And that's what I started to look for. You're listening to Infinity on KCBS News Radio 74 in San Francisco. So when you took a look at the Hebrew text of Genesis and you looked at the first part of Genesis, were you looking at all of the letters of all of the words or were you looking at the first letters of each of the words or the all last right. letters? Good. Or Excellent you... question. Okay. There is a legend, a, a Kabbalistic legend. It also shows up as a Sanskrit legend referring to the Sanskrit Vedas, of which I haven't looked at deeply. And the legend is, the secret of the universe is in the first letter of the sacred text. But if you're so stupid you can't get it from the first letter, oi, dummy, it's repeated in greater detail in the first word. You can't get it from the first word, oi. Well, we'll give it to you in greater detail in the first sentence, in the first paragraph, in the first chapter. Now, I'm using those words liberally because we don't know what the first ch chapter was. We don't, that was. Those divisions were made recently. But we do know what the first sentence was. And I took the first sentence as the first natural unit of the text that I could deal with. It had enough information. There were 28 letters in the first sentence, so it had enough to deal with, and yet it wasn't so big that I couldn't handle it without a computer, because I had to do this manually. I didn't have access to a computer at the time. And the first sentence is, according to this legend, one of the natural units of the text. The secret of the universe is in that clump. Well, that also gave me a hint of something else, because that's a description of a hologram, or at least of a hierarchy. A hologram has the property that no matter how small a piece of the, of the negative you look at, you can still see the whole image. But it's fuzzier if you look at small pieces, less resolution. Uh, if you want higher resolution, you look at a bigger piece. That's exactly what the rabbinical Kabbalistic legend was about. Is there significance to... Now, I know you're dealing on a mathematical level and with the symbolism involved in those letters, but is there significance to the actual meaning of of the text since when you're right. dealing with the first right. line I'm going to give you the English right. translation in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth which is a pretty basic statement right. I don't know how how accurate the English translation well, is. well if you text, wonder how accurate it is I pick up a current copy of a biblical archaeology review which is a straight scientific publication they have an alternate I think five or six translations from currently respected text and mm -hmm. they vary considerably um, some versions start um, with without beginning or um, some translate the first word, they break it up into two words, and the word that's translated normally is in the beginning gets translated as God created six, and then they go on for the six days. And that same word, bereshit in Hebrew, can be broken up to mean in the beginning, or it can be broken up to mean created six, and all depends on what the original idiom was, which hasn't come down to us. The test for whether anything that I've assumed is a valid assumption is, in, te in a technical sense, is whether it clarifies the material. If I put in all these functions and all I get out is gibberish, then my functions were a bad guess and I, I made a mistake. But if, in fact, I count the Arecibo message in base 2 and all of a sudden I see a TV picture, then I know base 2 was appropriate for the Arecibo message. Fine. If I put my functions in and I get something coherent out, that indeed confirms that my guesses or my theories were, were correct to that point. Well, when I do that, I get something. And not only that, but it's recognizable. And not only that, but what it's recognizable as is incredible. The first sentence of Genesis, according to this form of analysis, describes a torus, a donut. Call it a bagel because it's the Hebrew Genesis I'm looking at. Um, that basically the shape of an of a inner tube of a tire or of a donut is the topological shape of the first sentence of Genesis. And that pattern is so strong that if a letter were to have been lost from the text over the centuries, 
it could be replaced uniquely. In fact, the Torah forms an error-correcting code for the text, and that has very interesting ramifications, which I don't think we'll have time to get into here. But the thing about the Torah that's so incredible is that that's currently the shape of first cause in physics. It also was the shape... What do you mean, first cause in physics? Right. Can you um, explain that? I think in one of the national publications recently, um, Roger Penrose, they did a section on Roger Penrose. Roger Penrose is a, is a respected physicist. I don't know him. Uh, I can't speak for him. But he um, has a theory that there is a mathematical abstraction, sort of the derivative of a particle, a mathematical abstraction that exists before the first elementary particle, before the first quark. He calls it a twister. The shape of the twister is a twisted torus, a, a bagel with a twist in it. Okay. okay, that's the smallest comprehensible at the unit moment that's of matter line. or reality or whatever. The topology okay. of a black hole is a torus, and that's a first order approximation. The technical folks will know what that means, and the rest don't pay attention. The shape of a photon, if a photon can be considered to have a shape, is a wave turned in on itself, a wave that's particleized, light being waves and particles. A particle of light is called a photon. Mm -hmm. Well, if you turn the wave in on itself to make a geometrical analog of what a photon's geometry might be like, it's a twisted torus. Okay, now we're getting on a real technical, and I don't want to get out into the twilight zone. Let me make somewhere. one more statement okay. on it. Okay. The thing that is startling, then, is that the first sentence of Genesis to religious people has always been literally the story of the creation. It is startling to find that at the letter level, Genesis is now accurate science, perhaps. And I, this is still conjecture. I haven't proven anything. This is just very, very strong conjecture now. And so that's what's startling. The religious people have been right emotionally in believing the material, maybe a little out of focus as to the depth of their understanding. I wish, after reading the material which you sent to us before we did the program, I had, and then there's no reference to what I'm about to tell you in that material, but as I looked at it, I had a recurring image in my mind as maybe the way that when you looked at the Hebrew letters, something struck you. And what I, I didn't tell you before we began the program is that the image that I kept getting, even though it wasn't in the text of what you said, was a wheel within a wheel. And I know that that's biblical that's, language. And it's and also it a description back. of a Taurus. And it, and it was extremely strong, and it was uh, uh, an image that came out of <laughs> wherever well, this program is coming out See, there, you're already. See, it's already done you a world of good. Um, the, uh, a wheel within a wheel is in, indeed how you generate a torus. If you take a circle and you rotate it through a circle, it forms a torus, a wheel within a wheel. A torus is, is, is if... Um, if we had television, I could show you folks. Okay, now, where, where are we going to go with all of this? You're, you're still in the process well, of analyzing mathematically, scientifically, right. in terms of physics, the, num the numerical values that you've given to the letters. and, and The what work is very preliminary, and it's speculative, and it's certainly not ready for publication. In fact, one of the, um, our most serious concern is that if we publish the material prematurely, it won't be seriously considered by the technical community, which is very sensitive to occult material. There is a lot of resistance to going beyond traditional 19th century physics among most physicists even in the 20th century. 19th century determinism says that the, the occult stuff is nonsense. Um, 20th century relativ relativity and, and uncertainty physics says the occult stuff might be possible. And so we have to approach this very carefully, very systematically. The patterns I'm getting are nice patterns, but if you look hard enough and if you're an artist, you can find a pattern in almost anything. We need to find a reputable statistician with some knowledge of linguistics that can establish the, the independently establish the statistical validity of the patterns. Just because I can make a torus doesn't prove that that's what the Pythagoreans and the Essenes did, or doesn't prove that's what Moses or God did, or, or Atlanteans, or wherever the message came from. I mean, you can force that. Now, we have looked ahead in the text. We've now covered the first day, the first five verses of Genesis. And the coding does continue, although I can't make it as clear. I can't tell you what the image is. We've looked um, as far as about 2,200 letters into the text and have found markers where we predicted them to be. And so we have reason to believe the coding goes that far. But right now, we're, we're looking for support. That's one of the reasons we wanted to do the program with Okay, you. let's jump out there now, since we're not going to put it in writing where some scientists can tear it all apart. We're going to just have a, a friendly discussion of this fascinating concept right now. You made reference to Atlanteans. 
or whatever. If, in fact, what you have a strong feeling that you stumbled onto for, and I, I think, again, the interesting thing is, one, the way this program came about, which is somewhat mystical, and uh, I don't have time to go into all the details of that. Two, the imagery which came to me, which there is not one single reference to a wheel, within a wheel, or anything else of that biblical text in what you sent for me to read in it, but all the right. imagery was strong. You had a personal experience. Okay. Now, that's what most of the scientific community doesn't remember it had. Most clear official scientists have what they would almost term enlightening experience when they have that, aha, I see it. And most researchers or mathematicians find that kind of transcendent beauty in their work. That, um, let me tell you, scientist, is what the mystics are calling that enlightenment experience. And they have the same thing with their personal um, experiences. You can't build science, however, objective external reality on personal experience. If I tell you that Genesis is coded, um, that's a life and death issue because what the code may say may be very important. It certainly shakes the, the tree of Western civilization to, 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 to shake Genesis. Um, serious matters, matters of extrasensory perceptions, matters of transcendental effects, of life and death nature, you can trust someone else to say there's something worth investigating there. But if you believe the other person, you become a follower rather than a person who experiences it for themselves. And so don't believe me that Genesis is coded. Um, wait until you see it from your experience. Don't believe the people that have been on your program that say ESP is real. Believe them when they, t when they tell you that they believe it's real. And check it out for yourself. Okay, and let but the let, me, let me turn that back on you. What about the people who say there are chromosomal messages and DNA molecules? And as I suggested earlier, I haven't seen those, and yet I'll accept that as the nature right. to my being, Same my thing. reality, my personality, hair color, right. eye shade, and all the rest. Right. Uh, you, can, you can pursue truth through any path that you pursue with integrity. You can find enlightenment and your fulfillment through broadcast media, the programming you do. And if you pursue it honestly and diligently, it will open up reality for you. Um, and you don't have to learn the math, and you don't have to learn ancient philosophy. Every person's path, if they, if they pursue it with integrity, will lead them to their fulfillment. And that's what enlightenment, that's one way of defining that, that kind of conscious growth. As a scientist, you may have a tough time with this one, but what about your, if you can remove yourself from that level, what about your gut feeling, and obviously you're very close to it, and, I, and you don't want to blow it by getting people, giving the people the wrong idea, but where did it come from? Who put the codes Excellent there? Question. We believe the codes are there. Where, like, where do the codes come I'd from? I'd like to add something to that. You've been so quiet, John. Yes, Go I right have. ahead. Jump in. Uh, when I was in the Middle East about two years ago, I got a chance to look at the pyramids for the first time. And the, uh, they were astonishing to me. And one of the legends that I read about was that the pyramids were built by the scientists and the, arch uh, the architects of Atlantis a long, long time ago, 10,000, 20,000 years ago. And there's been a lot of research on those, on those buildings, particularly the Great Pyramid. And none of them provided an adequate explanation as to how the pyramid was built, in my mind, because this building is phenomenal, and you'd have to see it personally to understand what I mean. When I had a chance to review Stan's research, when he talks about the torus, and when I look at it on a piece of paper, the torus appears to be an overview for the pyramid. And in fact, you can put the first sentence of Genesis in Hebrew on the pyramid in a pr very precise pattern. And that indicated to me, at least personally, that perhaps the text of Genesis was created by the same people who built the Great Pyramid in Egypt. And there was a connection for me in that way. And that's why I'm very curious to see what the text might contain, what information might be there. Do the either of you have a feeling about whether these people still exist? Or let me Other answer a slightly different way. Okay. I, I have two answers. The first answer is almost a non-answer. I believe that each of us sees the world through glasses that we color with our beliefs that if the new age is coming and I'm a religious person, I may experience that as the coming of the Messiah. If I'm a technologically oriented person, I may see any, a, a flying saucer land. If I'm a scientist, it may be discovery of anti-gravity or a time machine. Um, it depends on your, what your perspective is, how you see something. And so where this message came from depends on which metaphor you buy into with your lifestyle. What about the, f the, the other question? Do these... Do the originators of this language